This episode of New Politics was released on the 2nd of March, 2024, and produced on the lands of the Wangal and Wajuk people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, the university's accord has been released. Is it a good first step or should there be a revolution in higher education instead? Scott Morrison is finally leaving Parliament, but is it also the end of the Howard era of Conservative politics? Is the Coalition really ahead in the polls? And should we say goodbye to by-elections? I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis, not named by the head of ASIO. And thank you to our new subscribers. Since we said that we don't have billionaire or millionaire owners, we picked up a few new subscribers during the week. So thanks a lot for your support. And you can support us through Patreon and Substack. And all of these smaller amounts and micro donations means that we're not influenced by anyone. And as we keep saying, David, this is all a good way to support independent journalism. Independent journalism is becoming more and more important as the mainstream media is tied up further and further and further by its own corporate interests. It's the only place that you can get differing viewpoints and genuinely differing viewpoints and a better look at the news. Not just ours, but I like to think we do a good job. We definitely appreciate the support and it's really nice to get the lovely feedback from you. It's nice to get corrections and even the odd bit of negative feedback if it's constructively done. But even negative feedback means that we've provoked you to think sometimes. Some of the negative feedback they clearly haven't thought. (laughs) But the good stuff, it's really gratifying. And I want to add my thanks to Eddie's, to everyone who has uh, supported us in all the many ways that we can be supported. The Labor government has released the University's Accord Final Report. It's a report that took over 15 months to develop and the emphasis is on being able to change the higher education system substantially over the next 20 or 30 years and being able to create lasting reform so that Australia has the skills and knowledge that it needs to support the economy and its society. So it is an ambitious plan in numbers at least. There's a plan to increase the number of university educated Australians between the ages of 25 to 35 from 45% to 55% by 2050 and double the amount of university places to 1.8 million over the next 20 years. And there are also plans to remove the Job Ready Graduate Scheme and that was introduced by the Coalition and pushed up the HEX fees on humanities courses up to $14,000 per year. The University's Accord, it is a substantial document, but it's mainly based around funding for the sector. There's nothing about improving the teaching quality within academia. There's nothing about improving industrial relations within the university sector, which has got some of the worst working conditions of any sector in Australia. And there's nothing about the massive impact of the current level of hex debts on graduates and how unfair and inequitable that system is. So it is a good start, but what's needed within the higher education system and the overall education system is a revolution and a massive change. And it seems that what we are getting are piecemeal solutions and an ambitious plan that might be ambitious, but it's not ambitious in the right way. It's a mess. I worked in the tertiary sector for many years teaching humanities essentially I did a little bit of logic and uh, some other courses but it was mostly in the fields of history and music and while it was enjoyable in many many ways and if I have any students listening hello to you all you could see problems the amount that they're charging for a degree when education is an end in itself and is an investment labor scrapping Whitlam's Free University was a colossal mistake. It was a disastrous mistake and it was a shameful mistake because when the coalition came in, they just saw it as an ATM so they could divert the money out of higher education into other projects, yet people were paying more. And it's disgraceful how much people are paying. Partly it was to lock out people of lower socioeconomic standards And when you add in the privatisation of health, for example, where you have doctors charging an absolute fortune, 
partly because they can, but also partly because they have such a massive hex debt that a, a young doctor can't afford to rent in the area that they practice in, for example. Let's not get started with the education system, but certainly the tertiary sector needs to change. We also need to do things like reteach people the value of general degrees. I see you know, people say, oh, I'm self-educated and I think the Bachelor of Arts is the biggest waste of time ever. And it's like, the Bachelor of Arts is actually a really good degree because it teaches you generalism, it teaches you critical thinking, it teaches you communication, it teaches you how to argue, how to construct an argument, how to think about things. So we need to get people thinking back as to the actual value of education. And to go back to my original point, the conditions as a casual academic are absolutely terrible. It is terrible exploitation, essentially. And many graduates would have been looking at what will change within the HEC system within this University Accord report, which is now a bad and terribly unfair system. And it's always been a bad and unfair system ever since it was introduced by a Labor government in 1990 and made worse by successive coalition governments. And whatever reasons were used to introduce the HEC system, and that was to expand the university sector and make more places available, that's already been achieved. So essentially, it's just a continuing tax on education, and now it's an out-of-proportion burden on graduates. And it should have been scrapped altogether. And there is going to be some reform to the current HEC system where courses are going to be assessed according to their value. So we won't have that ridiculous situation where lower income graduates in humanities are paying the same level of HECS as high income graduates in law, medicine and finance. So that might be a start, but it's just not good enough. And if we had a reasonable mining tax, instead of almost giving away Australian minerals and resources to a few wealthy mining magnates like Gina Reinhardt and Andrew Forrest, we could have a free university education system instead of what we have at the moment, which is a tax on education and a large burden on many graduates. Richard Dennis, I think, pointed out that we get more money from HEX than we do from the mining industry. And the thing is, is that the natural resources of Australia belong to the Commonwealth, which means that the paltry rent that the mining companies are paying is criminal. And whoever, whoever approved it... And whoever keeps approving it should be thrown out of parliament and live a life of ignominy and shame. The priorities by government since probably Fraser have been all upside down and we've got to change it. And there's been quite a bit of commentary about the performance of the Minister for Education, Jason Clare, and here he is commenting about the university accord process. I tell everyone that's at uni now and everyone that's thinking about whether they go to uni or TAFE that going to uni, it is so worth it. And if you doubt me, ask somebody else that's been to university and ask them if they regret going. It sets you up for the future. It opens your mind to new possibilities as well. In the years ahead, we're going to need more people to go to TAFE or to go to university. Otherwise, we're going to have an economy with a handbrake on. We're not going to be that productive, bold country that we want us to be. We're not going to be the country of our imagination. We can make that real, but we've got to make sure that we build the skills we need for the next decade and the decade after that. And a lot of that work happens in our TAFEs and happens in our universities. And I think that he's quite an impressive performer and the commentary in the media has been in the context of leadership material, but it's usually in the context of trying to be mischievous and put pressure on the leadership of Anthony Albanese. And I think that Jason Clare would be a good leader for the Labor Party, but there's already someone in that position. So that's not going to happen in the short term. But aside from that, the plans in the University Accord are incremental and it's deliberately so. And the idea is to have plans and ideas in place and have long term reforms that are not susceptible to changes in government but quite often when there is a change of government and Labor's not going to be in office forever and who knows they might end up lasting just the one term as, and as unlikely as that is there's always a chance of that happening but even still a government might be in for two or three terms and make those incremental plans which take us halfway to where we need to be then a new government comes in and it's usually the coalition that does this and they unwind all of those reforms that have been put in place and that's exactly what happened with the Gonski reforms that were hijacked by the coalition. Labor tried to implement a plan that made funding for school education more equitable. The coalition came into office in 2013 and undid all of that work and now we're back to where we started, trying to make school funding more 
equitable so that schools like MLC in Sydney don't end up spending $107 million upgrading their already Olympic standard swimming pools and public schools go without funding for basic resources. And that's the one thing that I fear about the university accord process. It might be an incremental process that might lead to good positive changes within the sector over the next decade or two, and provided that the Labor government remains in office. And even then, we might only get halfway there to where we need to be, and then the coalition will come in and undo those reforms. And they only usually undo the reforms because they were implemented by a, a Labor government. This goes back, of course, to one of the things we've been banging on about the last few weeks, the utter, not only inevitability, but necessity for the Liberal Party to reform to something more constructive, more positive, more in line with mainstream Australian views. I did like the comment on our um, Patreon page where after I had argued for a a better centre-right party, someone said, we already have a centre-right party in Labor which was pretty funny and not without merit. <laughs> the hope is, is that if the Liberal Party became a decent centre-right party, of course, Labor would push to the left and become a, a decent centre-left party and we could get to elections. I nearly said get back to elections, but maybe I'm being too starry-eyed about the past. We could get to where the two major parties are actually talking to mainstream Australia about mainstream Australian concerns rather than winning the media battle and winning this and scoring points. And that's, again, not to deny good backbenchers and decent people within both parties. They do exist on both sides. Maybe it's a bit harder to find them on one side than the other, but they're in there and they they do that. As for the funding for schools, I think it's grossly obscene that MLC can build an Olympic standard swimming pool well, they've already got one. They're renovating their Olympic standard pool. Yeah. When there are schools in Sydney's west, not 50 kilometres away, that are struggling to maintain a library, that don't have air conditioning, that don't have enough teachers, that are relying on people not sending their kids to private schools so the funding numbers can be kept up. I think we have to really start to think about What is it we value? And do we value giving the rich more stuff? Or do we value helping everybody? I think the other consideration here is that the coalition is hostile to the university sector. It seems like they're hostile to the entire schooling education system. And it hasn't always been like this. Robert Menzies was the one who initially expanded the university sector in the 1960s. Malcolm Fraser did have that razor gang that cut back university funding in the 1980s, but he was nowhere near as hostile as John Howard, Tony Abbott or Scott Morrison were to the sector. And I think that hostility was shown during the beginning of COVID where the university sector was totally excluded from the JobKeeper support program. And They've never actually explained why that needed to be the case at that time. So it's usually the politics that affects higher education. But overall, the development of the education system in Australia, I think it's hamstrung by the structures that we have in place. And overall, it is one of the best education systems in the world. It's ranked number seven in the World Education Index. And just pointing out that it was number one up until 2001 and then started dropping after the Howard government introduced the SES funding model for schools, which made funding for schools more inequitable. And David, we've been criticised for laying the boots into conservative governments too often. So I'll just put this out there as a statement without comment. Australia was the number one education system in the world up until 2001. The Howard government made the funding system more unequal and inequitable, and the ranking of the Australian education system dropped to number seven. And we still have that same SES system in place. And I'm just struggling to work out what the problem is here, David, but maybe one day I'll work it out. But the political control over education spread over different governments and different levels of funding. Higher education is funded by the federal government and by graduates, of course, and there's a hybrid funding process for schools. And that's between the federal government and state and territory governments to varying degrees, but the schools are controlled and managed by the states. And early education is funded through a combination of federal and state governments and local councils. It's managed at a local level, but the accreditation and regulation is managed by the federal government. So it's an absolute mess. And that's why I suggested that there needs to be a revolution within the 
education system, and that's the entire education system, not just higher education, but because there's so many different layers of funding and political involvement, perhaps that's something that's totally impossible in Australia. And the Coalition hasn't responded to the University Accord report, and that's probably because they realise that there's not too many votes to be gained there, but they're also probably more concerned about leftover ideological battles from their university days, or they're still arguing about voluntary student union fees, or promoting the teaching of Western civilization and then kicking into the humanities. But I think they need to stop that bickering and just get on board with meaningful reform of university education and the entire education system instead of using it as political football. Do we want a smart country? Do we want a country that can meet the challenges of the future? Or do we want a bunch of feeble-brained nobodies with no clue, no idea and no vision? Now, we already know the answer to the second one because we've had that for the last decade. We have to make sure that Labor brings in a fairly watertight, airtight education system that really allows for the future benefit of Australia. We've been the lucky country. We never quite got to the clever country. And that's not to deny the very clever people who live here, of course. But a lot move away. Yasmin abdel Magid a very smart person, makes some arguable and valid comments on Anzac Day and is hounded out of the country. She's not the only one. How many scientists have gone just because there's no future in trying to do good science here? Because there's a group of nobodies who doubt everything science does because it's this huge conspiracy, who get way too much airtime who are listened to way too much and whose views no matter how ridiculous and derided they are are still bouncing around in public discourse you can have whatever opinion you like but opinions come with responsibilities we're seeing the wrong side not being held to account for what they're saying this is new politics available through apple podcasts spotify amazon audible Google Podcasts and YouTube. Up next, Scott Morrison to leave politics, but it's also the end of the Howard era. Scott Morrison, as promised, has made his valedictory speech in Parliament and it was probably the least anticipated valedictory speech in Australian history. And the electorate probably isn't so concerned about these types of speeches now. They're happy to hear a valedictory speech on election night if a Prime Minister is defeated and then announce that they're leaving politics. But almost two years later, I think it's a bit too much to expect that there'll be too much interest. Here are some experts from his speech. While a noble calling, politics can only take you so far and can government can only do so much. You can say the same thing about the market. You won't find all the answers there either. And you won't find it in unrestricted libertarianism and more command and control communism. In the Liberal Party, we have always believed in how great Australians can be rather than governments, with the true test being how we are able to enable Australians to realise their own aspirations. I suspect that much of our dissolution with politics today and our institutions is that we have put too much faith in them. At the end of the day, the state and the market are just run by imperfect people, like all of us. While politics may be an important and necessary place for service, I would also warn against it being a surrogate for finding identity, ultimate meaning and purpose in life. There are far better options than politics. So, Mr Speaker, I leave this place not as one of those timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat, I leave having given all in that arena, and there are plenty of scars to show for it. While I leave nothing of my contributions on that field, I do believe that in that arena will always remain any bitterness, disappointments or offences that have occurred along the way. I leave this place appreciative and thankful, unburdened by offences, and released from any bitterness that can so often haunt post-political lives. This is due to my faith in Jesus Christ, which gives me the faith to both forgive, but also to be honest about my own failings and shortcomings. 
But the speech itself, it was all about Scott Morrison. It was defensive. It talked a lot about his Pentecostal beliefs. And it was almost like a greatest hits tour where he mentioned the quiet Australians, the fair go for those who have a go, the arc of autocracy, whatever that means, standing up to China, the Cronulla Sharks. And we're not going to get into the debate about whether Scott Morrison is the worst Prime Minister Australia has ever had. We've already had that debate and he's already pushed over Billy McMahon as Australia's worst Prime Minister and we've got the award here if he wants to come and pick it up. But it's more about what this represents. There's been talk about this being the end of the Morrison era. Well, that's pretty obvious, but it's more like the end of the Howard era, which went on this continuum from 1996 to 2022, from Howard through to Tony Abbott and then on to Scott Morrison. It was put on hold when Labor was in office between 2007 to 2013 and a little bit when Malcolm Turnbull was the Prime Minister, but it never really disappeared. Peter Dutton is still persisting with the Howard era thinking and negativity, but I think it is safe to say that it's the end of the Morrison and the Howard era. I finally watched Nemesis. It took me weeks to build up the resistance to the bile that I knew I was going to generate watching it. And if there's anyone from the production team listening, I, I thought it, you did a really terrific job in putting together the interviews and telling the story. There were things that were missed, no doubt, and I understand time constraints, but I thought it was a very well done documentary on a pretty parlous era of Australian history. And the Morrison one really showed his weaknesses. Someone they're interviewing would say, probably the most notable one was Josh Frydenberg and Morrison. And they asked Morrison, are you and Josh Frydenberg still friends? And Morrison says, look, it's in a, a good spot, as good as can be expected. And basically saying, we might not have been as close as we were, but, you know, we're still friends. Josh Frydenberg said, we are not friends, <laughs> essentially, and I'm paraphrasing that. To the point where in the, in the making of interview that they do, which is, which is worth watching, Mark Willisey had to ring up Josh Frydenberg just to confirm that his memory of what Josh had said and his interpretation of what Josh Frydenberg had said was correct. And that really, to me, sums up the Morrison era. Lies, mistruths, misdirections, positive spins, media perception, nothing of substance and very little that could be trusted. And his speech was exactly that. Look, personal faith, I'm all for it. People can construct their moral and ethical and spiritual lives in a way that suits them best based on their experiences and their journey, as long as it's genuine. And I've never had the feeling that Morrison's faith was genuine in, say, Kevin Rudd. But I'll, I'll try and think of someone on the Liberal Party side. Because well, we've probably never had anyone like Morrison before. No, we haven't. Actually, I think Peter Costello was a person of faith. And while I still think he's one of Australia's worth treasurers and all of the qualifications, he never used that faith as a battering ram or a stick to beat on people. He used his ideologies. <laughs> but my point is, is that the really hypocrisy of taking a, a religion that its adherents claim with scriptural justification is about love. And if all he had done was robo-debt, that's enough to disqualify that. But there was so much more. I don't think we needed a valedictory speech. Robert Menzies kind of gave one in his retirement speech. Malcolm Fraser kind of gave one when he lost the election. But when Bob Hawke stepped down, he just stepped down and left Parliament when Kevin Rudd lost, so he kind of gave one when he lost. Julia Gillard didn't give one. Paul Keating didn't give one. So it's a weird thing, and I don't know quite where it comes from, but it's unnecessary, and I'm guessing that it will be something that's quite forgotten. And there should be some level of respect for former Prime Ministers, but it does have to be a two-way process. And we can't respect someone who trashed convention so badly and was so incompetent, was pretty much only there for self-interest and ego, and for the Pentecostal church, as it turns out as well, rather than the public interest. And it's a little bit like trying to offer platitudes and show a bit of respect for General Pinochet in Chile or... Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, and I'm not suggesting that Scott Morrison disappeared people like those leaders did in those countries, although he did go close with that 
robo debt scheme, but it's just hard to show any respect to political leaders like that. And a few of our audience have asked us, well, how do you stop people like Scott Morrison ever getting into office again? And you can't really. That's the democratic process. The vetting process is during election time where the electorate cast judgment and the only thing that we can really suggest is that people pay more attention at election time and few people in the seat of Cook would have known who Scott Morrison was back in 2007 when he entered parliament or would have known about the backstory about how he wasn't the pre-selected candidate for the Liberal Party and how he ruined the reputation of Michael Tauk, the person who actually did win pre-selection. And not many people would have known about all of those scandals that he was a part of in Tourism Australia and in the New Zealand Office of Tourism, where he was sacked from both of those positions, and that was before he entered Parliament. And there were media reports about it at the time, but Still, the connections weren't made that this was the same Scott Morrison who was just about to enter Parliament. And the seat of Cook, that's a safe seat. Morrison didn't really have to worry about campaigning in his local seat. And then he embarked on a 10-year quest to become Prime Minister. And I guess there's also the speed of politics where things just move so quickly. People don't have time to digest what might have happened in the past. And the other factor is that you don't really know what a Prime Minister is going to be like until... They actually get there and although there were many warning signs about what Scott Morrison was going to be like he still managed to get there and we can't really say anything good about the Morrison prime ministership yes he did manage to get there but it's just it's not enough just to say well getting to the position of prime minister means that you've done a good job and he probably did put aside his ideological partisanship during the early parts of COVID in 2020 but even then, he had to be corralled by the premiers into effective COVID management. And the JobKeeper support program was an idea developed by the unions and promoted by the unions. And that was actually resisted by Scott Morrison and Josh Frydenberg until they realised that they didn't really have any option. Yeah, it's almost incredible. I mean, I guess one of the positives is that he did prove that anybody can become prime minister here. And perhaps that's why we don't want just anyone becoming prime minister. If you take the top five prime ministers in terms of ability, and and I'd put that in Chifley, Curtin, Deacon, it gets hard after this. Top three is not too bad. Top three is not too bad, yep. Menzies, I guess, and um, probably Hawke. Morrison's nowhere near that. Morrison, I doubt, could articulate a coherent vision politically for what he wanted even if he couched it in the theology of his uh, faith. Morrison, I don't think, could look at the whole of the country and understand the various subtleties and nuances between what people in the outer suburbs of Perth are worried and people in the rural communities of South Australia are worried about. Often they're the same thing, but sometimes they're completely different and conflicting things. I doubt Morrison could really understand what was going on in the Liberal Party. The few times he spoke about the Liberal Party in the past, he was so grossly inaccurate. You wonder if he'd actually done much more than read the Wikipedia page on people like Robert Menzies, let alone have a deep understanding, which, again, for all his many, many, many faults, and he was one of the worst, John Howard did at least have a broad and deep understanding of Australian political history. Malcolm Turnbull did too. I'll, again, I'll be fair there. Tony Abbott, who knows? <laughs> There's no inner life with Morrison, even though he says there is. I don't think there really is. I don't think his faith is one of depth. I don't think his political philosophies are one of depth. And I don't think his attitude to whatever position he is in has any depth to it. In Nemesis, he talked about how suburban dads say things awkwardly. Well, you're not a suburban dad. You're the prime minister. You don't live in the suburbs and you're not a suburban dad. And that you think you are suggests problems in your perception of the country. And I guess really his legacy can be summed up in when he tackled that little kid on the soccer field in a rugby tackle. Wrong sport, wrong age, wrong technique. Everything was wrong. And it was probably the last thing that the undecideds looked at and thought, yep, I'm out. Hello, Albo. You know. Oh, well, I'm going to be very, very generous. And I will say that Scott Morrison is in the top 31 of Australian prime ministers. So that's a positive thing to put out there. But I think it's this style of politics. It's 
it's all horribly conservative, it's negative, it's belligerent, it's bellicose, it's generally guided by hate and a fear of others and it's a divide and rule process that makes people work against each other instead of working with each other and it was started off by John Howard in 1996 and highly influenced by the US Republican Party and I think that conservative politics has always been a little bit like this, but it was taken to a different level by John Howard, and then it was ramped up by Tony Abbott in 2013, and then taken in a new direction by Scott Morrison. So it's hard to say whether this style of politics has ended. Peter Dutton is a product of the Howard era and is a replicant who is only too happy to continue with this type of extremism. And we saw it last year with the Voice to Parliament referendum, and we still see it now. And there's also a new batch of young Liberals who are emerging. Some of them are already in the New South Wales Parliament, and from what I've seen, they seem to be a combination of the worst parts of all of those terrible Liberal Party Prime Ministers. And I think it is a never-ending process. Bad people with bad ideas do get into politics because there's not enough attention from the electorate, but it might be the end of some kind of era, the Howard era, the Morrison era, whatever you want to call it, but there'll always be a new bad era coming along to replace it. And, you know, sorry if I sound a little bit cynical, but that's just the nature of politics. Yeah, I agree with term limits. I think you should get four goes in the House of Reps and two goes in the Senate. I think the parties need to be held to account as to who gets selected. You're still going to get bad eggs. You're still going to get scammers you're still going to get people who can't get jobs anywhere so go into politics as a last resort some of them grow of course and some of them swells as an elder in new guinea once said to paul Hasluck about the administrators some of them grows and some of them swells and the other thing he said and this is not really first they make you think you're jesus christ then they crucify you and i think that's true in a lot of cases too but i think we need to rejig parliament I think the two-party system is collapsing. I think we're going to go through a period of minority government for a while, while the two major parties reform. And I suspect there's a chance that they'll kind of split down the middle and those four quarters will join up in various ways and form new parties. It's in a lot of people's interest to keep the status quo. So bring your popcorn, as the Americans say. It's going to be a bumpy ride. This is New Politics, one of Australia's top 10 podcasts on Australian politics and news commentary. You can support us through Patreon and Substack, and also find us at newpolitics.com.au. The essential poll is showing that the coalition is ahead for the first time since the 2022 federal election and it's polling at 48% while the Labor government is at 47%. And the reason why it doesn't add up to 100% is that essential doesn't include the undecided voters. And the other poll that arrived during the week was news poll and that's unchanged at 52% for Labor and 48% for the coalition. So what does this all mean at the moment? Well, absolutely nothing, because there isn't a federal election on at the moment and won't be for some time. But there is a by-election in the seat of Dunkley, and that's likely to result in the Labor Party hanging on to the seat. But there is more focus on by-elections, and there's also a tendency for national issues to have more prominence in by-elections. But a loss, I think, will have greater ramifications for the Labor government. And that would have to be a 6.3% swing against Labor for them to lose the seat. And if the coalition lose the seat, well, they don't actually hold the seat and they're expected to lose the seat anyway. So it can always be written off and spun politically to suit their narrative. 
And Labor governments generally panic when they lose by-elections that they are expected to win, so an already cautious Albanese government would probably become even more cautious in the event that they do lose the seat of Dunkley. But whichever way the result goes, it will be analysed to an inch of its life about what it means for both parties in the next federal election. But governments just have to continue with whatever they need to do and not be too worried about the result either way. It'll be analysed not just here, that's probably important, but if Labor loses, and they may, I don't think the Liberal candidate's strong enough, to be quite honest, but it might go to a an independent, and the very sad death of Peter Murphy will be a factor, whether there's a sympathy vote for, look, we want our Labor candidate to carry on the great work she's done, or whether it's, no, we were so attached to Peter, we can't see anyone else from the Labor Party in the role for the moment, or somewhere in between there. And I suspect it'll go to Labor. I suspect it'll be a a big swing. It may not be a safe seat after this by-election, but anything's possible. But even if Labor loses, they still have four seats in the House of Reps that they can use to keep winning votes. I think, too, with Labor, a lot of it's going to have to do with how strongly people feel about Labor foreign policy at the moment and the situation in in Gaza. And I think that's the white elephant in the room nobody wants to talk about, except on social media where everybody wants to talk about it. Labor's lost significant, but how significant, I'm not sure, support thanks to this. Balanced against that, the tax cuts are coming through. And so the good people at Dunkley may wish to thank Labor for this. So it's... A crucial election in terms of what will it tell us about opinions on each party, but only in that seat, of course. But in terms of how it swings out, I don't think it will make that much a difference moving forward. I think if the Liberal Party lose, it won't actually cost Peter Dutney's job. And I don't think Anthony Albanese is going anywhere in the short term either. And the average by-election swing against in government-held seats is 7.1%, and in all seats, the average is around 3.6%. And if we break it down even further, the swing against first-term governments is only 1.5%. But there's always a whole range of statistics that can be cherry-picked at every by-election, and I suspect that there'll be quite a few cherry-pickers around on Saturday night. And there's a guarantee that the result will be spun favourably by both sides of politics. And there's always more of a focus on by-elections as well, and that's because there's just the one seat, whereas in a general election there's 151 elections and there's always results that can get lost in the mix. But I did notice that there's a conspiracy theorist and sovereign citizen running in the Dunkley by-election, and that's Darren Bergworth. And according to some opinion polls, he's expecting to receive around 7% of the primary vote. And there was an interesting interaction between Bergworth and Craig Kelly. And Craig Kelly is the former Liberal Party MP who spent most of the past four years pushing forward his anti-vaccine information and a wide range of conspiracy theories. There's so many issues. Huh? Mm-hmm. Well, no, hang on, hang on. Let's bring it down to one issue. Yeah. These fuckers are criminals, and yeah, they've okay, all got okay. to go to get money. Right, okay, okay. Right? They're, 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 that's the one issue. Right, so, so the only way to do this is to vote them out in an election? No. We need to wake the people up and, and just okay. walk away from the system, right? Yeah, but, because we are under foreign occupation, right? And in the law of war, the only reason is our consensus to, to keep voting for these muppets, right? The minute we walk away and say, no, we don't consent, you have no authority, we don't want you, have you no anymore, power and they no are finished. They have to actually hand the keys over. Right, without even we raising a fist. Our consent to and, that's what, a fact. and then what happens? Well, the people are, are the starting people to get rise together. Up. We, hey? You have an election. No, we, we, we sort out who is going to yeah, run. How do you do that? Well, we're you organizing. Have to, you have to have an election. We'll be organizing. Yeah, yeah, but, but you're and saying. We're growing, building towards that. Yeah, yeah, but, but you ultimately. Can see, the media yes, oh, there'll be no Liberal Labor. Yeah, but Darren's ultimately. running for. And you can't really see it in a podcast, but the face on Craig Kelly was a little bit like Dr. Frankenstein when he realises what he's done and he's created an absolute monster. And this is the creation of Craig Kelly and other people who have been pushing their conspiracies over the past few years. And they don't do it because they actually believe in all of these ideas. They do it because they feel that they can harvest votes and gain 
political advantage. And this is what happens when you encourage extremists. If they see someone like Craig Kelly, he talks about all of these things when they're in Parliament and then continues in the public spotlight after they leave Parliament, it sort of validates their extremist viewpoints. They talk about arresting politicians and sending them off to Guantanamo Bay. They talk about not having elections. They talk about rising up and I don't know what effect someone like Darren Bergworth will have in this by-election and elections in the future. And I know that this is all part of the democratic process, but this is the consequence of Craig Kelly's words and actions over the past four or five years. The sovereign citizen movement, which is aligned to QAnon, has some quite bizarre ideas. Such as not having elections, even though they're part of this election. Yeah, and it's clear that Bergworth wants to get in and just arrest everyone because he says, and you can't quite, it's not clear, but it's there. If you listen closely to the clip, he said, oh, we've got the people, we can just install them. So it's clear that he's going to try and run some kind of coup. The notion of a sovereign citizen is that the Australian constitution is invalid because it was changed at some point, but not through referendum, through legislation constitutional lawyers if you can wrap your head around that and explain that to me i'd be most grateful explaining to a sovereign citizen that the constitution has been changed in fact eight times through referenda is meaningless there's something to do with the decimal currency not being a real currency which i just no currency is a real currency it's just a tool to establish value in such a way that you don't have to barter there's no such thing as the queen of australia even though there is no such thing as the Queen of Australia since the uh, death of the late Queen Elizabeth II, but that the Queen, or I guess now the King of Australia, is a private company that trades on the New York Stock Exchange. And I get tired (laughs) just thinking about it. Uh, It's clearly not mainstream stuff. And, of course, it's great because it distracts from actual issues. It undermines science. Part of the anti-vaccine movement was coming out of billionaires actually trying to undermine climate science because if you can undermine one type of science you can undermine all other types of science too that don't profit you at its very bottom it's based on a kind of a christian uh, white supremacy even if a lot of its followers don't realize that but all of its arguments go down to the supremacy of the white race trademark copyright italics off and yeah craig kelly the next day announced that he was taken up a new position as campaign director of One Nation after being in uh, Clive Palmer's United Australia Party for several years. Whether the two are related, I don't know. But I imagine that if he had any wavering doubts, he snapped them up because One Nation is slightly less loopy than the UAP. And there's also been a debate about whether we should end by-elections in the Senate whenever there's a casual vacancy when a senator dies or retires. The party that they came from has the right to replace that senator without having another Senate election. And that saves a lot of time and money because otherwise there'd be an entire Senate election in the state where the senator came from. And Paul Keating did once say that the Senate is just unrepresentative swill, so we wouldn't want to spend around $25 million just for the sake of re-electing one senator. And the cost of a lower house by-election to the taxpayer is between $2 million to $5 million, depending on where it is. So it's not a massive cost, but it still is a cost. And then if we didn't have by-elections, well, what would happen? Would the seat then go to the candidate who came second or would the party that the candidate came from then make a selection? Or what happens if someone's an independent? What do we do there? The other issue is that there would need to be a change to Section 24 of the Constitution, which stipulates that members of the Parliament must be chosen by the people of the Commonwealth. And Section 24 doesn't actually say which people, though. But essentially, there would need to be a change to the Constitution, and Australia doesn't have a good record with constitutional change. But we don't actually have too many by-elections in Australia. Dunkley will be the third by-election of this term, and there'll be another one in the seat of Cook with the departure of Scott Morrison. And David, you and I love elections, so we'd like to see more of them. So maybe it's best to leave this set up in the way that it currently is. It makes a whole lot of sense that the Senate is as it is. Senate elections are complex. It would require the whole of the state to go to find one person And when it works, it works well. Of course, in 1975, 
Joe Bjocchi, Peterson, Premier of Queensland, and Tom Lewis, no relation, Premier of New South Wales, both flouted the convention of the Premier of the state advising the governor of the state who would be the replacement senators. The part they flouted was that you took the advice from the, the party who they were leaving from. In an independent case, the, the independent usually says, well, I anoint <laughs> so-and-so as my replacement. And the premier goes to the governor and says, that's it, and it's all done. Both Bjorki Peterson and Tom Lewis ignored the advice of the Labor Party and put in their own candidates, changing the balance of the Senate. Uh, and we all know how that ended. And if we don't, I thoroughly recommend Jenny Hocking's books on the subject of the dismissal. The other thing a by-election can potentially do is change your government. And of course, sometimes maybe that's the best thing to happen. I think getting the change will be difficult because even when it's to their advantage, the current Liberal Party will oppose. Peter Dutton is trying to hold on to his job. So you'd think that he would be all in favour of not having elections which could affect his job. <laughs> but he would oppose it just because it's something they could oppose and run against. So I think it's something to look at next term. But I, I think you're right. We should have a really good inquiry over it and work out whether we should change it. Because, yeah, we don't have many, usually two or three or four by-elections a term out of 151 seats isn't too bad at all. And it's also Mardi Gras weekend in Sydney, so happy Mardi Gras. And it's been a difficult week for the LGBTQI community with the deaths of Jesse Baird and Luke Davies and also because of the behaviour of the New South Wales Police Force and one member in particular. And the New South Wales Police Commissioner Karen Webb has been frivolous and insensitive in her public commentary on this case and it brings up all of those memories of police brutality against the LGBTQI community over the years. So it is a sensitive issue and the community is not so sure about whether there should be police in uniform at the Mardi Gras march and let's hope that it all goes as well as possible this year. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. And if you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.